We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill me heart with thy love. May so be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Well, good evening. We are glad that you're here with us tonight at the University Church to worship God with us. Uh, we do want to remind everyone, if you would, make sure you grab a bulletin and note the prayer list. Uh, we hope that you're spending time in prayer with all of our families here who are in times of need, whether that be illness or otherwise. So please grab a bulletin and make sure that you're spending, in, spending time in prayer uh, for those in need. Tonight before our worship, we have a few reminders for some activities. Um, the youth group on May 31st will have the kickoff, and as Ray called it, the kick out uh, for the summer youth ministry on the 31st. If you want more details, you can see Tucker. Um, we also have a congregational meeting next Sunday at 414, and I think I'm just as confused by the time as you are, uh, but 414, not 415. Uh, so please keep that in mind for next Sunday. Also, uh, today is the deadline for the Summer Sewing School. So if you're wanting to be involved in the Summer Sewing School, make sure that you sign up and pay by tonight. Otherwise, there might not be uh, supplies waiting on you when you show up. They need to know tonight, so please sign up. Also, the last reminder we have on here is that the office will be closed tomorrow for Memorial Day. And it's a good thing because I think the AC in the offices is out. So that'd make for a fun day. So we might just be out all week. We never know. Um, but a few things for our worship tonight. Uh, John Podine will be leading our singing. Finter Northern will have our opening prayer. Reagan Amos will have our scripture reading. Joseph Vickery will have our closing prayer. And of course, our speaker tonight will be Randy Medlin. Uh, before we begin our worship, let's read from 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2. Let's read together. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Let's pray. Our God and Father in heaven, Lord, we come to you tonight, and on such a, a beautiful night, we are so thankful. We're thankful beyond words, God, for your church and for the ability that we all have to meet together and to encourage one another to sing these songs together, to learn from your word. And God, tonight I pray that you'll guide all of us. Lord, I pray that we will focus on worshiping you for these few moments, uh, that we'll be here tonight, not just to check a box to say we were here, but God, I pray that we're here tonight to worship you, to encourage each other. And Lord, I pray that we will all listen attentively tonight as Randy brings your word to us. Lord, we're so thankful for this church. We're thankful for our elders, Lord, and we pray that you'll continue to bless them with wisdom. We pray that you'll continue to bless them with patience as they guide us here. And God, we just pray through whatever means necessary, Lord, that you will use us to be a light in this community, that we can show uh, your love to a community and to a world that, that really needs it right now. So I pray that you'll give us boldness, and I pray that you'll give us insight to know how to reach our community. And Lord, be with us now as we enter into worship. It's in the, ni the name of your Son that we pray. And amen. If you're following along in the, with your songs on the bulletin, we'll be singing these first two songs here together. First one, shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah. Shabbat 
Let's pray together, please. <clears throat> Holy Father in heaven, we're so grateful unto thee as children of thine that we can assemble here tonight before thy throne, also with all of those around the world who have assembled today in faith in the Lord's church. Help us to realize what an occasion this is. Help us to sanctify thee in our heart and to open our hearts to the fact that this is the greatest thing that we can do on the face of this earth. It's to bow before you, our Father, you, your Son, upon the throne, and help us to give ourselves to you more. May this service be such that we are edified in heart so that we realize that what we learn here, we will take out in the outside of this building, into our hearts, let our light shine before others, that we might help this world in some way. Holy Father in heaven, we're mindful of those who may be sick in the congregation, those who may have lost loved ones or who are bereaved. We pray for them. We know that you love them and you know exactly how to minister to them. Help them then to lean upon you and to receive then the comfort of the comforting Father that you are. Holy Father, we also pray for this dear and wonderful country in which we live. We're so grateful for the freedoms, for the price that others have paid that we might gather here tonight and worship thee in spirit and truth unmolested by any force. We thank you for those leaders in Congress who will exercise themselves in good judgment and be about effecting and executing the things that we need to have in this country for a better and more beautiful country. Holy Father, look down upon us as we wait for the message from Brother Randy tonight. As he speaks, open up his heart. Help him to remember the great things of thy word that he's prepared. Help us then to open our hearts to the message that is before us. Help us then to realize what a wonderful occasion this is to be able to be present to hear thy word. And as faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, may we live here with a deeper faith than ever before. Help us to love each other more as the children of God. Thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness of our sins through your Son. In his name we pray. Amen. Number 394, please. 394. Mm -hmm. What a fellowship, what a joy divine leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine leaning on the everlasting arms.
home book and like to go ahead and mark our invitation song will be number 667. I'm we'll sing this following Brother Randy's message tonight. But before our scripture reading and his message, let's stand and let's sing number 222, please. 222. reading will be coming from the book of Proverbs chapter 15 verses 13 through 15. Proverbs chapter 15 verses 13 through 15. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by the sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken. The heart of him who has understanding seeks knowledge, but the mouth of the fool feeds on the foolishness, on foolishness. All the days of the afflicted are evil. But he who is of a merry heart has a continual feast. You never know what you're going to see when you come to the worship assembly on a holiday weekend. We know that there's a lot of our folks who are traveling, taking advantage of the longer weekend. But I know of a few hundred that are not traveling because here you are. And thank you for your priorities and for being here tonight. If you will be turning in, in, in your Bibles to the Old Testament book of Proverbs, chapter 12 would be a good place to start. We're going to be looking almost exclusively tonight at the Proverbs of Solomon, talking about the subject that, uh, uh, that we're considering for the next few moments. I, I remember being in a bookstore, no surprise there, one time, and I saw a very thick, spined book on the shelf that I, after reading the title, decided that I just had to have and, and read. And it was uh, written by John, Dr. John A. Schindler entitled, How to Live 365 Days a Year. 
And you can understand why I was intrigued by the title. I think anyone who has any kind of uh, zest for living and, and, and wanting more vitality in, in their lives would read a book like that. But in it, he discusses a, a sickness that he refers to as a medical doctor by the initials E-I-I. And it doesn't take very far, too many pages into the book to realize that the initials E-I-I stands for emotionally induced illness. That within itself is intriguing. And the doctor said that people are physically sick. There are physical symptoms to their illness, but their emotions are what has made them ill. Uh, the renowned Dr. Schindler goes on to state that 50% of the people who are treated by physicians are there because of EII. That's, that's 50%. And that means every other hospital bed is filled by someone with no real functional malady other than emotionally induced illness. In order to back up his conclusions, then, in some of the previous or the, the subsequent chapters of the book, Dr. Schindler investigated, for example, a well-known clinic, Ochsner Clinic, I think it is in New Orleans, Louisiana. In that clinic, he said there was a test that was done of 500 consecutive patients who had been admitted with gastrointestinal problems. And then after the examinations, it was concluded that 74% of those who were admitted for that particular diagnosis were there because of EII. And then another study conducted in the outpatient department of Yale University Medical School produced some very similar results. The conclusion was there that 76% of those coming to that department for treatment were there because of emotionally induced illness. Dr. Schindler also wrote that part of the problem is that doctors were afraid to tell patients that they have an emotionally induced illness. He said they'll, they're afraid that they will you know, get angry and then demand to have another doctor. I want someone, a real doctor who can diagnose my real problem is oftentimes the reaction. Well, understandably, it's a hard thing for a person to admit, especially to hear from a professional who has done a professional medical diagnosis. And he went on to say that 90% of all headaches, dizziness, and even chronic fatigue are emotionally induced. Again, all of those things are intriguing, and I, I think it's an interesting perspective on the human condition. Tonight, I want to give you not EII, I want to give you some GMM. A little of God's miracle medicine, because Solomon gives us several doses of it in this old, wonderful Old Testament book of Proverbs. What does God think about the human condition? What does God say that we need most in our lives? Ponce de Leon, the Spaniard, of course, came to Florida looking for the fountain of youth. And he never found it, of course, according to what we've read in history. But that's because he didn't look in the book of Proverbs. The fountain of youth really is found in, in God's holy word. Proverbs 17, 22 says, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. That's what I want us to think about for the next few minutes tonight. I want you to begin by thinking about the misery of a heavy heart. Think about the condition, the abject condition of someone who has EII or someone who is like the persons that Solomon is describing in these passages. The first thing it does is it burdens the soul. Listen to Proverbs 12, verse 25. Anxiety and the heart of a man causes depression. That sounds almost like a modern day diagnosis, doesn't it? The body as well, and this is what Solomon is communicating to us in that brief statement, the body as well as the heart is, is bowed down with a load of care. It causes depression. It's a load that you and I, by the way, were never meant to carry. An old story has frequently been told about a man walking down the road on a hot day burdened by a, a very heavy bag of burlap bag of, of grain that he had thrown across his shoulders and another man passing by in a buckboard wagon saw the man trying to carry that load in that in that hot condition his wagon pulled by a horse of course in those days and said hey, hey it's too hot for you to be down there walking and trying to carry that load climb up here on the wagon and I'll be happy to give you a lift well the man with a load of grain on his shoulders climbed into the wagon and sat down they rode to, uh, for some distance, and after a while, the fellow with the reins looked over and said, My goodness, sir, put that grain down. You don't need to carry it on your shoulders. And the man said, Oh, no, it's enough that I ask you to give me a ride without carrying my load also. Well, that sounds silly to anyone with any reason, but there are a lot of people that would claim that that's ridiculous, have forgotten that while Jesus is able to cleanse us from our sins, are the very same people who say Jesus cannot carry the load that I'm carrying. Isn't that ridiculous? Spiritually speaking, God says, I can not only save you, I can carry your load. The greatest invitation ever given, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
And some folks, though, even as, as godly, conscientious Christians say, Lord, I can trust you to save me. I just can't trust you to carry this load. Well, the Bible says in Psalm 55 and verse 22, cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. That's, that's God's promise to each of us. The old song puts it this way, take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Second, it breaks the spirit. Listen to Solomon again. This time Proverbs 15, 13. If you can catch up and, and, and look at these passages, I think it probably will mean more to you. Proverbs 15, 13, at least the version that I read, says this. A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. First thing we have to do, I think, when we're looking at a passage like that is to identify and define what the word broken there means. The spirit is that innermost part of a person. It, it's the wellspring of life. It is the deepest part of an individual. It is the seat of re reason. It is that which allows us to think, calculate, use logic. Even our emotional life is controlled by, by that, that spirit within us. It, it's one matter to burden the soul. It's another to break the spirit. And you and I know that. You, you can have a burdened soul, folks, and you can get over it. But when a person has a broken spirit, man, they're in deep trouble. Have you ever seen a person with a broken spirit? I, I think so. If, you, if you've lived on this planet long enough, you've seen one, a person who has a broken spirit. You, you've seen the light go out in their eyes. The spark of vitality has gone. The enthusiasm has disappeared. The zest and the fight have all gone out of that person, and there's nothing left but just a shell of that person. We've all seen that happen. General Douglas MacArthur, one of our heroes, spoke these words. And I'm quoting, he said, youth is not a time of life, it's a state of mind. Nobody grows old by merely living a number of years. People grow old by deserting their ideals. Years may wrinkle the skin, but to give up enthusiasm wrinkles the soul. Worry, doubt, self-distrust, fear, and despair, these are the long, long years that bow the head and turn the growing spirit back to dust. And then he ends by this brief paragraph. You are as young as your faith, as old as your doubts. You're as young as your self-confidence, as old as your fears, as young as your hope, and as old as your despair. That's not inspired writ, but I believe that's true. I think that he had a powerful insight into the human nature. The third thing Solomon says, that this kind of concern about and anxiety in life can create is that it buries the body. It has a physical impact on us as well. Again, Proverbs 17, 22, a merry heart does good like a medicine, but a, but a broken spirit dries the bones. The soul affects the spirit, the spirit affects the body, and the body begins to deteriorate. It begins to wither and decay. Now I realize that this, these bodies in which we live were intended to be temporary. They're not here forever, and we understand how that the aging process works and how that we wear out, and some, some of us understand that more than others. But by the same token, sometimes we age prematurely and unnecessarily because of the way we think, because of what's going on between the ears. Eventually this body will die, we know that, but not because necessarily of the hardening of the arteries. Sometimes it's because of the hardening of the attitudes. It dries the bones, is what Solomon says. So the entire body is affected with emotionally induced illness, with, with what has come to be known as psychosomatic illness. Frederick II ruled over Sicily in the 13th century, before the days of modern psychology, and he wondered what kind of language children were speak, would speak if they grew up in an environment in which, get this, no one ever spoke a word to them. It's hard to imagine that primitive thinking that would lead to any kind of experimentation on that basis, but he wanted to know. What language would they speak if never, no one ever spoke to them? Well, being a dictator with supreme authority, no one dared question his, his authority, and so he decided to perform a cruel experiment. He took certain newborn babies from their parents, put them in foster homes with the instructions that nobody was to speak a single word to those infants. No one was to make a sound around them. And so his perverted curiosity wanted to see what kind of language that they would speak if no one ever spoke to them. And he never found out because within a year, every one of those babies had died. Another similar experiment immediately after World War II in Germany Another harsh experiment was performed on 100 orphans. I'm not making this up. I wish I was. 
Fifty of those children were placed in one orphanage and fifty in another. The first orphanage gave those children love and, and happiness and conviviality, and it was just a wonderful environment in which to grow up. But the other orphanage gave those children absolutely nothing except stern discipline. They were never praised. They were never complimented. They were always only told what they had done wrong. There was no laughter. There was no fun. There was no kindness. There were no games like children naturally play. And yet in both of those orphanages, 50 children in one, 50 in another, they all had the same heating and the same cooling, the same housing, the same clothes, the same exercise, the same food was provided. But after only one year, the children where the joy and the happiness were a part of their lives were on average two inches taller and several pounds heavier than the children in the other orphanage. The other group was disease-ridden and sickly. Coincidence? I think not. What happens in our minds affects our bodies. And we need to understand that what Solomon wrote thousands of years ago is still true today. The misery of a heavy heart, Solomon assured us, really does bury the body, causing many, many people to even die prematurely. Not only that, but secondly, the mastery of a happy heart. I want to turn this on its side for a moment and look at it from a more positive perspective and I think that you're probably all ready to go with me to that place. Think for a moment about the solution that Solomon gives. So if a heavy heart causes anxiety and depression, then what is the remedy for that? God, God has given us good medicine to master the misery that's common to the, a fallen race and, and Solomon says that that medicine is, is a merry heart. The scripture isn't just talking about fun and games in that passage, although that's a part of the spinoff. It's one of the byproducts. The scripture's not just talking about, I think, humor or laughter, although I think that's another byproduct of the mentality, the attitude that Solomon is, is per, trying to persuade people to adopt. Some people claim that Charles Haddon Spurgeon was the greatest Christian preacher who ever lived in the Christian community. But one lady came to him after one of his lessons and severely criticized him for using humor in the pulpit. And he replied, oh, don't criticize me. If you just knew how much I was holding back, you would be praising me. You see, he had an effervescent, joyful spirit about him that sometimes reflected even when he was in the pulpit. But when we're talking about a merry heart, what language actually that Solomon is using is talking about is talking about joy, not just laughter, not just joking, not just fun and games, but a deep abiding joy that will be in the heart no matter what the circumstances of life might be. So the mastery of a happy heart is when that joy is there. We needed to identify that before we move on. Now I want to give you two or three subtopics under that to help us to appreciate how that we can actually adopt that. It's one thing to say we need to have a merry heart, and you're saying, well, yeah, if you had the problems that I would have, it wouldn't be quite easy, that easy for you to say that from the pulpit. Well, that's the problem, isn't it? Everybody thinks that they're having a tough time. Well, wait a minute. Can we, are, are we doomed to live with anxiety and depression? Absolutely not, Solomon says. So first consider the seat or the source of that joy. Jesus once said in Matthew chapter 12, specifically in the latter part of verse 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Some were interested and concerned about ceremonial uncleanness in terms of what they were eating and drinking. And Jesus said, that's not the major issue here. It isn't what goes into a person. It's what comes out of a person. And what comes out of a person is always what is in the heart. That's the biblical heart and the heart of a man or woman. And then Solomon said in Proverbs 23, verse 7, of course, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. In Hebrew psychology, the heart is, is the core of the individual and the seat of joy is in that heart. It doesn't depend on things. It does not depend on thrills. It does not depend on adrenaline rushes. It comes from the heart. You know, think about this in these terms. The devil, when he began, begins working on a person, usually begins on the outside and works in. Our God starts on the inside and works out. Isn't that true? And I believe that that transformation, that change, that adjustment in our thinking, in our attitude, if, if we may call it that, is what Solomon is addressing here. And God tells us in his word the source of that joy. Listen to Proverbs 16 and verse 20. And whoso trusts in the Lord, happy is he. Now you thought it was going to be complicated, didn't you? He who trusts in the Lord, happy is he. 
Now, there's a whole sermon that goes along with identifying what trust, truly trusting in the Lord is all about. But let's just take it at face value for tonight's purposes. The Lord Jesus himself is the source of that joy. That's for you and I living on this side of the cross. I know that because in John 15 verse 11, I think we talked about this about three weeks ago. Jesus was talking to his disciples on the night before he was crucified. And what he said to them was, of all things... These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might be with you and that your joy might be full. Imagine that. He's about to die. Within 24 hours, he's going to be nailed to a cross. And yet when he talks to his disciples, it isn't a woe is me sermon. It is, I want you to have the same kind of joy that I have. I want you to have my joy and I want your joy to be complete, to be full. That to me is absolutely amazing. That's revolutionary kind of thinking, but it shouldn't surprise us that it came from the lips of our Lord. So before his crucifixion, he's talking about joy. Now, we, we can read and we can sing songs about Jesus being a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief because that is certainly one of the prophetic messages about him. But do not ever get the impression that Jesus was a sanctimonious, pale, religious recluse. That's not the Jesus of my Bible. Jesus was, was a man. He was a man with a heart, with a message, with a mind just like you and I. He was God incarnate. He walked in the flesh just like you do and I do every day. And yet, despite all of that, Hebrews 4.15 says he did not sin. That's another amazing thing about him. But as a matter of fact, the Bible describes the, the Lord Jesus this way. Listen to this description. If you think Jesus was a pale wimp that walked around afraid to ever address any kind of conflict in his life, Hebrews 1.9, the Bible describes the Lord Jesus this way. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness, the oil of gladness more than your companions. What's the Hebrews writer saying by inspiration there? That just means that nobody who ever walked the face of this earth had joy like Jesus had joy. But we know how that his life turned out. Yes, it was not in spite of that. It was in large part because of that. He did what he came to do. And he was able to say it is finished with his dying breath. No wonder Jesus had joy. Even though the circumstances were atrocious beyond our ability to comprehend as he, was, as he was scourged and then nailed to that old rugged cross, Jesus still had more joy than anyone else who's ever lived. And so that's why he could affirm in John 15, 11, I'm going to give my joy to you. The joy that you and I can have today isn't some kind of cheap imitation, some kind of knockoff of his. It's, it's the real thing. If you truly have a viable relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ tonight, you can have not someone else's joy, you can have your joy that will take you through the vic vicissitudes of life. An article sometime back in the Reader's Digest said that man needs three things in order to be happy and fulfilled. Three things we need. He needs someone to love. He needs something meaningful to do. He needs something to hope for. I think that's right. I I'm not a psychologist, but I still, from my limited perspective, think that's right. And when you think about it, Jesus Christ was all three of those things personified. He really is all we need. He's certainly someone to love. John reminds us in 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. He's something to do, serve the Lord with gladness, Psalm 100, verse 2 says. He's certainly something to hope for, according to Paul. Listen to Titus 2, verse 13 for a moment. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God, and our Savior Jesus Christ. I wonder tonight, is there a spirit of anticipation in your heart? Are you really looking forward to the Lord coming back? Are you longing to see his face? Are you on bated breath because you want to see him so badly? And you're not dreading that day. You're looking forward with deep anticipation. Folks, that's joy. And that joy is a strong, strong medicine. I'm glad back in the Old Testament that, that Nehemiah had a dependable source of joy. Here's what he said in Nehemiah 8 verse 10. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Wow. Of, of all the things that it took for them to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and, and the physical ardor that was a part of that process. And then the conflict of those that were Sanballat and others that were trying to keep them from doing that. And then the conflict. People actually were attacking them when they're on the walls. But, but Nehemiah's singular message to them was the joy of the Lord is your strength. 
That, that's what will keep you going every day. If you have the joy of the Lord in your heart, and that real joy is, in fact, a strong medicine. The Executive Digest said that even induced laughter gives you strength. It affects every organ of the body. Now, I'm not talking about forced laughter here or fake laughter. I'm talking about something that's far more potent than that. I'm talking about, again, the joy of the Lord. The, the poet Elizabeth Barrett, I don't know a great deal about. I was not a literature major in college, but I know enough about her to find that she lived a very intriguing and interesting life. And she was an invalid for many years. Many of you know that. In fact, she was so um, incapacitated physically for a large part of her life that she was unable to lift her head from the pillow. Now, I would call that a serious difficulty, unable to lift her head from the pillow. But one day, she met a young man by the name of Robert Browning. In just one visit, he gave her so much joy and happiness, she was able to lift her head from the pillow something that she had not done in a long, long time. On Robert's second visit to Elizabeth, she sat up in bed. On his third visit, they eloped. You cannot tell me that what goes on in the heart of man does not affect the body of man. We see it happening every day. Man, that's some strong medicine, isn't it? But I'm telling you tonight that the joy of the Lord is even stronger than that. Medically, it's true. Dr. Schindler said that the happy emotions affect the pituitary gland, which in, in turn affects the entire body. And yet in his book, Dr. Schindler never, ever, I read it from cover to cover, never referred to the Lord as the source of that desperately needed joy. What I'm saying is, people tonight, without a hint of boasting, he knew the problem. You and I know the solution. Second, it is not only the source, but the stability of that joy. Listen to Solomon. Proverbs 15, verse 15. All the days of the afflicted are evil. Now, I, I want to assure you, we're not going to stop just there because that really would make you want to fall on something sharp, wouldn't it? All the days of the afflicted are evil. In another place, he said, the way of the transgressor is hard. I think those are very similar observations. But people burdened with care are unable to even to see the good things that are happening to them. Everything in their days, Solomon said, are evil because they're looking at it through those tinted glasses. So the even good things, they don't notice. They notice all the bad things. Do you know people like that? And the rest of Proverbs 15, 15, here's the good side of that coin, reads like this. But he that is a merry heart has a continual feast. What a contrast that is. That's why Jesus said in John 15, 11, these things have I spoken to you that my joy might remain in you. He, he wanted them to know that my joy, once you have it in your heart, is, a, is, is something that's stable. It, it, it will not change. It will not vacillate. You will always have it as long as you continue to walk in my footsteps and be my disciple. So we need to understand that your joy is no better than the source of that joy. Folks, if you get your joy, and I'm just going to say it like it is, if you get your primary joy in life from your friends, if you get your joy from possessions, if you get your joy from your health or from your business, then you're getting your joy from things that can and probably will at some point in life change. That's just not the case with the joy of the Lord. Facing the cross, he was talking about his joy and the joy of his disciples. And his joy was self-contained. That just means it was stable. He that is of a merry heart has a continual feast. His joy stays. That's what Solomon is saying there. Let me tell you this, and I hope you're listening tonight. Satan, and if you need to write this down someplace, please do, because I really want you to remember this. Satan has no happy old people. Do I need to say it again? Satan has no happy old people. The poet Lord Byron lived high. He was intelligent, handsome, virile. He was a young man who had good looks, wit, and charm. But even as a young man, his perspective on life, his world value, caused him to write these words about his own existence. I'm quoting, my days are in the yellow leaf. Now, that's just a poet's way of saying, I'm past my prime. Autumn has come for me. I'm no longer green on the vine. I'm yellow. He, then he concludes by saying, the flowers and fruits of love are gone. The worm, the canker, and the grief are mine alone. Everything going for him, but nothing to live for. Problem was, he was seeking his joy in all the wrong places, and it did not last. Finally, 
think with me for just a few moments about the ministry of a happy heart, and then we'll be through. God does not give us his joy and his strength so that we can serve the devil. No, obviously not. He gives us this, his, this kind of strength that we've been talking about tonight so that we can more effectively serve him. First, this joy is to be sought. That is, it is to be pursued. It's not something that will come naturally to you. You can't just pray for joy, wake up the next morning, and all of a sudden you're deliriously happy. No, it's something that, that, that is a process. It requires doing and thinking the right things on a daily basis. So this is not an automatic thing at all, and I don't want anything that I say tonight to leave that impression with you, that you can just you can have it and, and snap your fingers and, and all of a sudden it's yours. You can have medicine in the cabinet, but it's not going to benefit you unless you actually take that medicine. And that's true of what Solomon has instructed us to do here in God's holy word. Every day you must decide to receive the joy of the Lord. Now we've already seen from reading what Solomon wrote here that a merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken, so that has already been established. But look at the verse that follows it. This is Proverbs 15 verse 14, at least the first part of that verse. The heart of him that has understanding seeks knowledge. The heart of him that has understanding seeks knowledge. You are to seek the Lord. Let me ask you, did you seek the Lord with all of your heart this morning? Did you saturate yourself with his presence? Jesus said, these things have I spoken unto you that, that you may have joy. Well, what things was he talking about? He, he taught that if you go back in John 15 and start with verse 1 and then dip down into verse 4, he, he said that we are to abide in him and he in us. So again, it's not an automatic thing. Here, here's the way you get the joy of the Lord on a daily perpetual basis. It is by being his disciple every day, by doing what he would have you to be doing, by making those decisions from the framework of the will of God in everything that you think, say, and do. A man one time wrote his congressman asking, where is all of this happiness that the Constitution of the United States guarantees to us? And the congressman was wise enough to write back, and here's what he said. You had better reread the Constitution. It does not guarantee you any happiness. It only guarantees you the pursuit of happiness. And that's right. Those are two different things. And this is especially true, folks, in the spiritual realm. The heart of him that has understanding seeks knowledge, Solomon says. Second, this, this joy is not only to be sought, it is also to be seen. Proverbs 15, 13 reads, A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance. What you have in your heart, you will wear in your face. It's what Solomon is saying. If you have this joy in your heart, it ought to show when people see your expression. Now, do you want to know the re real reason that you're so tired? I'll tell you. It's because it takes 72 muscles to frown and only 14 to smile. Think about, think about all that wasted energy. I like to read bumper stickers, and you can tell a lot, I think, about a person driving the car by the kind of bumper sticker that they've chosen to put on their car at least most of the time. I remember riding down the road one time, and I saw a bumper sticker on the back of a car in, in a nearby lane that said, smile. God loves you. And it had a smiley face, you know, graphic on, on the bumper. And I thought, how wonderful, a believer. And, and then I, I sped up and, and came alongside the car and looked in the window. And the woman who was driving that car had to have been in the middle of a gallbladder attack. I had never seen such an unpleasant, angry, sad disposition on the heart of any human being. And I thought, she needs to take that bumper sticker off her bumper and put it on the dashboard where she can read it. We don't always live up to, to what we put on our bumpers. If she, if she had any Christian joy at all, it wasn't reflected in her expression. Matthew Arnold, the famous British essayist, said, It is this that has made the future of Christianity. It's gladness, not its sorrow. It's drawing from the spiritual world a source of joy so abundant that it ran over upon the material world and transfigured it. That's just one man's opinion, but I think he's right. The joy that, that ought to reside in the heart and be worn on the face of God's people is the joy of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you don't have to tell how you live each day. You don't have to tell if you work or play. A tried to, true barometer serves in its place. What you wear in your heart, you wear on your face. The faults, the deceit that you wear in your heart will not stay inside where it first got to start. For sinew and blood are but a thin veil of lace. What you wear in your heart, you wear on your face. 
If your life is unselfish and for others you live, for not what you can get, but how much you can give, if you live close to God in his infant grace, you don't have to tell it. It shows in your face. And remember, a smile always increases your face value. One last point. This joy is not only to be sought, but it's also to be shared. This is the only way, folks, that we'll ever win the loss to Christ. One of the greatest testimonies that we have is the joy of the Lord in our hearts and lives. And if our neighbors and friends and coworkers and family can see that, and I mean sincerely and honestly, not something that you fake, not some facade, but if they can see that joy of the Lord in our hearts and lives, it's going to be a whole lot easier to win the world to Christ, isn't it? A cold, dry faith has zero appeal. I read about some gold prospectors out west who discovered a very rich mine back in the day when the gold rush was going on, and they exclaimed, hey, we got it made. As long as we don't tell anybody about this discovery until after we've staked our claim. And so they made a vow of secrecy. But then they had to go into town for provisions and supplies. And when they left town, there was a throng of people that followed them. Because while they had not said a word, they could see it in their face. It was impossible to hide what they had found. I'm telling you, this miracle medicine is of far more value than gold, isn't it? If you knew the cure for some dreaded disease, wouldn't you share it? Wouldn't you tell people about it? And I believe that the joy of the Lord is, is there not only to strengthen us, but also that, that we can transfer that joy into the hearts of other people so that they too can be blessed just as you and I have been blessed. I believe it ought to be a common occurrence in light of 1 Peter 3.15 for people to come up to, to God's folks in, in whatever context of life and say, will you tell me the reason for the hope that is in you? Peter said, envision that scenario and be ready to give an answer when people ask you that question. But, but maybe that's where we need to start, isn't it? And ask ourselves, has anybody seen the joy of the Lord in my heart and life enough to ever ask me that? Tell me why you have that joy and that hope in your heart. Without joy, real joy, life is meaningless. And I don't care what else you may have, the lasting joy is found only in Jesus. And folks, we need to be about the business of sharing that secret. Patrick Henry, that red-headed Virginian who was famous for saying, give me liberty or give me death, wrote these words in his will. To those who were receiving his inheritance, he advised with a following message, and I'm quoting, there is one thing more that I wish that I could give to you. It is the religion of our Lord Jesus Christ. With it, if you have nothing else, you would be happy. Without it, though you have all things else, you would never be happy. It's a wise man, isn't it? True joy is found in the Lord Jesus, and it's God's miracle medicine for the emotionally induced illness. I want to end with this. Cyprian, one of the church's earlier, early leaders, wrote to his friend about this joy in the heart of God's people. Here's what he said. This is a cheerful world, as I see it from my garden under the shadow of my vines. But if I could ascend to some high mountain and look out over the wide lands, you know very well what I would see. Bands of robbers on the highways, pirates on the seas, armies fighting, cities burning, in the amphitheaters men murdered to appease applauding crowds, selfishness and cruelty, misery and despair under all roofs. It is a bad world. But I have discovered in the midst of it a quiet and holy people who have learned a great secret. They have found a joy which is a thousand times better than any of the pleasures of our sinful life. They are despised and persecuted, but they care not. They have overcome the world. These people, Donatus, are Christians, and I am one of them. That's what we want you to be tonight, while we stand and while we sing. evil a victory win there's wonderful power in the blood there is power, power wonder working power in the blood of the lamb there is power, power wonder
wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus your King? There's power in the blood power in the blood would you live daily his praises to sing there's wonderful power in the blood there is power power wonder working power in the blood of the land there is power power wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Our closing song tonight will be number 702, please. Once again, thank you for being here tonight. I trust and pray that you will have a, have a happy and a pleasant Memorial Day. And I guess my last admonition would be to stay as cool as you possibly can. It, that may be a struggle. But I hope you have a wonderful day tomorrow. And especially if you decide to travel, that you'll be safe. If you weren't able to be here this morning and partake of the Lord's Supper, it's still prepared in the seminar room as John leads us in this last song. You can go there and you'll be served. Let's sing the first and last verse and then be led in our closing prayer. There it is. Trials dark on every hand and we cannot understand all the ways that God will lead us to that blessed promised land. But he'll guide us with his eyes and we'll follow till we die. We will understand it better by and by. By and by when the morning comes. All the saints of God are gathering home. Tell the story how we've overcome. We will understand it better by and by. Temptations, hidden snares often take us unawares. And our hearts are made to bleed for the thoughtless word or deed. And we wonder why the test when we try to do our best. We will understand it better by and by. By and by when the morning comes. All the saints of God are gathering home and we will tell the story how we've overcome. We will understand it better by and by. Bow with me, please. Father, we thank you for the blessing of another Lord's Day. Thank you for allowing us to be here and, and to be refreshed and renewed. Father, we pray that we would go forth and we would have the, the merry heart that we studied about tonight and the joy that is in our lives that comes from knowing that we are your children. And Father, help us to share that joy with all those that we come in contact with. Be with us now, watch over us. Please be with those that are traveling this weekend. Please bring us back safe at the next appointed time. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.